And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came forward to be baptized. And John the Baptist looked at them and said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oops, my bad. That was the Apostle Paul. John the Baptist said, you brood of vipers. Which is kind of what they expected to hear. All right? Would have been really nice if John the Baptist could have said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. But John the Baptist is not in that particular role at that time, and I don't think they could have heard the message that Paul, who had been one of them, was one of them, a Pharisee, was trying to express. I think they needed to come, all the people needed to come out and see, well, it seemed a little bit like a rock star had showed up, hadn't had a prophet for 300 years or so. They knew from locusts and wild honey and the way he was dressed and the way he talked, he must be speaking for God. So they came out for spectacle and maybe got a bit more. But they had to hear the message the way it could be offered to them, even if they didn't want to accept it. For instance, hearing something as simple as the roots of the trees, if they do not bear good fruit, will be chopped down. That would be a clear reference to the Messiah coming from the root of Jesse. Lineage, very important. The root of Jesse, Jesse the father of David, King David. And when we trace that lineage down, we get to Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus so Jesus is of the house of David. And you can see how that fits in to prophetic understanding of who Jesus is. Now, I mentioned the Apostle Paul. At the time of this baptism of repentance that all were coming forward to, Paul was still very much Saul of Tarsus. And, and I tried in my mind to imagine as if he was in that crowd of Pharisees being yelled at by John the Baptist, but geography kind of makes that hard to work. But at the same time, he's of the same age, because we know that Paul, Saul, never actually met the earthly Jesus. We don't really catch up with him as a character until we get into the Acts of the Apostles, we know of his writing and his letters, but in terms of how the early church understood where he came from, it's within the Acts of the Apostles that he hits the timeline. And we first meet him, Saul of Tarsus, where? He is at the stoning of Stephen. First martyr, deacon, one of the seven set aside to serve and help and preach. And, and by the way, if you we're kind of hearing Stephen preach, you'd hear echoes of John the Baptist, and no wonder they decided they didn't want to listen to him either. So fate follows strong and passionate words, but this was also strong, passionate, and faithful words that come from Stephen. And so we hear of Saul being there and moving on to do what? Well, what comes next for Saul is he's out there persecuting the people of the way the early Christians. He's on his way to Damascus, and it's recorded that he has this blinding moment with Jesus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He becomes blinded, falls off a horse, and then as the healing unfolds, he begins to see Jesus in the light that we who have met the resurrected Jesus see him because indeed he met the resurrected Jesus. And then as Paul, he gives us a great set of gifts. Some of them confusing because they're hard to read at times. But his introspection, his willingness to engage his journey for all of us is something to lift up and behold, especially during Advent. Remember I had said before, it was hard for people to hear the message 
from John the Baptist, but they knew they needed to hear it in the way it was spoken to them. Now Paul starts to write in a different way and starts to engage this Jesus in a way that is very personal to him and one which leads him to write, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So much a counter to the whole idea of finding God amidst a brood of vipers kind of speech. So I would offer you this. We are in Advent. Advent is a time when everything expected of us, the norms of family visit, purchasing, getting ready for Christmas, kind of fills all the space. And it's really hard to push it away to hear the message. Now, a simple way to hear the message is almost like a bumper sticker. Because we know Jesus has died, been born, incarnation, died, risen from the dead, and will come again. So one simple way to hear that is the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is to never forget the presence of Christ. So that, that helps us begin to say, okay, there's kind of our mission to try not to forget the presence of Christ, but my gosh, I've got to get to the store. I've got to go here. I've got to run there. How do we get more deeper? How do we allow God to invite and surprise us in this very busy, hectic, climatic time. Well, again, Paul offers, at least me, an image. It's a little bit like walking a labyrinth. Have you ever walked a labyrinth before? You look at it at first, it's big and round, and it looks like a maze, but it's not. Mazes have dead ends. The labyrinth, when you walk it slowly, takes you to a very deep center. It's a way of saying, I would like to be as close to God as possible, as if the hairs on the back of my head will stand up, as if I am in one of those Celtic Christian thin spaces where I can hear God in a way that the busyness of the world does not intrude. I, I think when Paul is writing, we see him trying to go on this kind of deepening journey. And we had presented to us today the letter to the Romans. Now, oddly enough, the letter to the Galatians was written far before the letter to the Romans, and scholars often think of it as if it is a rough draft of the letter to the Romans, in terms of Paul beginning to try to understand the enormity of the Jesus event that knocked him off his horse that he's trying to share with others who may not be ready to hear the message, but he wants to desperately make sure they hear it. He is trying to invite people into this joy of believing by trying to get folks to set aside preconceived notions of how they meet God. It's a gift to think about Paul trying to go deeper in a time of year when we are called to try to go deeper so that God can show us that God has always and already been there, ready to surprise us anew. Hopefully I've now set my story up well in the theological context of Advent. You know how when I stand here I have these sermons recorded. They're videoed, they're edited, and they are then put up on the internet. The one from last Sunday was one such sermon. And my aunt, uh, from my father's side of the family, my father's young sister, now dad would be about 98 this month had he stayed alive, he died about five years ago, and is 11 years younger. There are four children in the family. She lives in Maryland, and she sent me a nice Facebook text saying she had watched my sermon. Oh, I, I like that. That was nice, a family member contacting me. And then she said, did you know, a couple of words, that your uncle Ed and his wife Sue, now Ed is dad's second brother in the birth order, my father being the oldest, S. Leroy Thomas Jr., Ed and Sue lived just up the street in Middletown, New Jersey from Christ Church. She said, you could see the little white church 
This is in the 1950s before the building we are in now was built. And I decided I needed to find out more about this. So I did a little research and then I called uh, Anne to say, tell me more about this. Well, as we talked, she said, your grandparents, my parents, bought a farm around the corner from Christ Church, somewhere in Woodland, Eatontown, Scobieville. She had a bunch of names. It's around. I remember going to this farm as a kid. They paid $25,000 for it in 1950. It had two big houses on it and nine acres of land, something we don't own anymore. Wouldn't that have been nice? I remember riding a horse there and doing other farm-type things. Because we lived in Chappaqua, New York, which is like equidistant around New York City as we are south, it is north. So you can drive here fairly easily. And then and, and said, there was an event that happened at Christ Church in Middletown, the little white church, on May 29th, 1955. I said, oh, what was that? Uh, your cousin Chris was baptized there. I said, oh, this is getting really good. And I went into our parish records. Honest to God, we keep good records at this church and in the Episcopal <laughs> Church. Thank you, Reverend Van Dyke, for your good penmanship. And I read and I saw May 29th, 1955, Christopher Thomas, and then I saw Ed and Sue's name, and as I proceeded on, I then saw the signature that never changed, S. Leroy Thomas, Jr. My father was here as godfather. And his first cousin, Henry, was a godfather, and Anne was a godfather. I called my mother, to find out if we had come down for this. Um, now, my brother Donald was born in January of 1955. So, Mom wasn't sure if we came down or not. I was two and a half years old at this point. So, if I wanted to create the story for me from the root of Jesse lineage stuff, and my dad was here, then I was here. I could claim that as sort of like, wow, Lord, look at where I am now, and you had me sort of here before my dad. But I'm thinking, we didn't think that much about throwing children in the car in the 1950s. We didn't strap them down. We didn't worry about that. We just went. And since my grandparents lived around the corner and a baptism is a big event, and who, four month old, just wrap them in blankets, right? I think there's a truth, and it makes me feel right in a way that Advent makes me feel right when I'm listening carefully to God and paying attention. That just maybe I was here two and a half, at age two and a half over 60 years ago, and I'm supposed to be here now. I was in a building where I've baptized, where I witnessed a baptism. I was in a place of love that sort of infused. You see, as we prepare for Christ's coming, we're really preparing to remember that he's already been here, and he's always been here, and that love is always here. And so when I tell you this story, I want us to hear it not from the tone of John the Baptist, which isn't a bad tone for us to hear from time to time. But I want to hear Advent as if Paul was speaking to his brethren and sistren and saying to them these words that I think we all want to hear. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, and may you be surprised by God. May the blessing of God find you when you least expect it, 
and either need it most or are grateful to receive it. All these words I offer in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.